Hi everybody, I'm Raj. I'm Ashwin. And this is Blood Cancer Talks. Blood Cancer Talks is a podcast exclusively dedicated to hematologic malignancies, where we bring in content experts who live and breathe a particular disease or a therapeutic area, and we talk about the biology and clinical management. However, today's episode is slightly different. Today, we are excited to talk about career development as a clinician investigator. And there is no better person to talk about this than Dr. Ayali Teferi, who is a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Teferi is a giant in the field of hematology and has mentored numerous trainees and faculty. A few years ago at, at ASH 2017, Dr. Teferi gave an amazing talk to the trainee session on career development as a clinician investigator, which as a first year fellow at that time, I found very motivating and inspiring. Dr. Teferi, before we start, can you tell us about yourself and your current role for people who don't know? Of course. Let me first of all thank you, Raj and Ashwin, and Eddie in absentia for welcoming me back to your very important podcast. I really enjoyed it the last time. My name is Aya Luteferi. I'm currently a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And my clinical duties are probably about 60% of my time and the other 40% equally divided between education and research. Uh, as you might have noted, I didn't say administration. And there comes the first advice I have for all the fellows and students of medicine who want to really enjoy medicine, enjoy being a doctor, enjoy being a translational researcher, is stay away from administrative duties. You work very hard for no value, and the only thing that you profit is enemies. Uh, so that would be my first uh, advice. So I stayed away. That's why I am still young and happy. Uh, and then uh, by way of background, uh, I'm originally from Ethiopia, went to medical school in the University of Athens in Greek. Uh, and uh, I came here as a political refugee, and I was lucky enough to end up at the Mayo Clinic. And that is my second message to the fellows, is that anything is possible for a foreign-born person from all the way East Africa with nothing, coming in as a political refugee and ending up as a named professor at the Mayo Clinic. This is a land of opportunity indeed. And if you have the appropriate work ethics and perseverance, anything is possible. So the fellows need to remember that they can accomplish anything. It just needs um, a little luck and a lot of work ethics. At this point, my primary interest is in myeloid malignancies and primarily myeloproliferative neoplasms and low-risk myelodysplastic syndromes, eosinophilic and mast cell disorders. And so that's basically what I do, where I came from. And I think that answers your questions, right? Yeah, thanks for that. So let's jump right in. So first of all, we wanted to ask a little bit about mentorships. Can you please tell our listeners how they should approach choosing the right mentor? Let me start by clarifying this concept of mentorship. The best mentor you can have is yourself. If you were to ask me, who helped me the most in getting where I am? I helped me the most. I worked very hard. I was determined. And I have a work ethics. Nothing comes without cost. I didn't uh, enjoy my weekends and going and chatting away. I went back and did work, weekends, holidays, and what have you. And that spiritual mentorship that you get from your own self. The discipline and the perseverance is what's going to take you up there. Nobody else can take you out there. If you think about it, uh, you should respect yourself uh, to be better than anybody to mentor your own self. Uh, and then the next thing that I want to clarify regarding mentorship is there is no such thing as a mentor. You should have many mentors. You need somebody to mentor you on statistical analysis and interpretations. You need someone else to mentor you on how to communicate 
verbally as well as in, in writing. You need someone else to mentor you on how to take care of your financial issues. In other words, you have to look for all these people with different skills. No one person can have all these skills. So don't make the mistake. Are you thinking that I would just choose one mentor and that person will take me over? Absolutely not. And most importantly, there will be those who might not be very good, who might not have time for you to do all these things for you, but they can open doors for you. These are equally very important mentors. Those who let you be a first author in a journal or talk to you behind your back kindly in front of others that who might be helping you. So you need to have all of this in your camp. So I was going to ask a follow-up question, but I think you already answered that. I, I just wanted to ask it anyway to see if you had any other thoughts. We hear a lot about what should be the attributes of a good mentor. But I remember uh, that in the talk that you gave at Ash, you delved a lot into what it takes to be a good mentee. In your career, you have mentored many trainees and faculty. What is it that stood out to you of those you admire the most? Raj, first of all, there needs to be chemistry. We are human beings with blood in our vessels, not yogurt in our vessels. Human beings are going to act human. They're going to behave human. And there needs to be that chemistry between two people, whether it is husband and wife, friends, or mentor and mentee. There needs to be that thing that bonds these two. There is a given tech. This is the most important thing. As a mentee, don't go there just to take. Go there also to give. In other words, you have to be prepared to keep your mentor interested because they're very busy. There are many mentees. There are many other words. So there has to be something that you can give to them. There's a lot of scut work that they would love for you to do. Analysis, data preparation, and writing, getting the patients together and what have you. Do whatever it is in your capacity to help that person who then will be initiated to give you something in return. That person needs to have an incentive and they will treat you well, they will teach you well, and it's a vicious cycle after that. You have to go prepared to give, not only to take. Yeah, and one more thing I wanted to ask is when the expectations are not being met by the mentee and or mentor, how do you approach a difficult situation like that in, in your yeah. immense that's, experience you have? That's a very tricky situation. Now, first of all, mentees are like students. They're like patients. If a patient is not happy with the doctor, they're entitled to go to another doctor. It has nothing to do about the doctors. I've got everything to do about the patients. It's the same thing with mentees and mentors. If the mentee feels uh, shortchanged or jetted and not, not getting what they want, they need to move on. They need to move on and find better people to hang around with. You don't have to stick. Don't worry. Don't worry too much about hurting the ego of that person. That person has got one, many, one million other things to do. You'll be just one less work for that person. So don't feel bad if you don't think that it is going, you don't even have to tell them. You just stay away and then do other things and what have you. They understand, they can read uh, the writing on the wall and answer. But now, on the other hand, when the mentee is not providing the same, Okay, I think that's the tricky part because then we have to be careful. As mentors, as older people, we need to be sensitive. We're dealing with a human being. The one thing I do is I find things that they can do, easier stuff. They don't have to do I, It's not about me getting what I need. It's about them getting something from me. So if somehow they're not meeting my expectation in those things that I need, then I will find something they can deal with in that little time to do so that there is that peace between us while we're not necessarily directly working aggressively. 
think that's a good point dr taferi one other thing i want to ask is writing is an integral part of our careers however it may not come naturally to everyone and you are someone who's known for writing well regarding one of your recent articles in american journal of hematology dr vincent rajkumar wrote on twitter that this is also a master class in how to write and communicate complex medical information clearly and no one does it better than dr taferi what advice do you give to your mentees regarding writing scientific manuscripts first of all dr rajkumar is a very good friend he is biased but he and i have been here together and we're both foreign graduates again uh, there's another foreign graduate for you who's made it to the top and we always discuss these things because we're both involved in education we speak uh, out most of us uh, both of us in a lot of venues and it's always a very it's see it, it's almost like no matter how much i try i'm not going to be able to dunk like michael jordan okay no matter in other words there are some talents that are inborn and some people are wired differently with different skills some people write very well in literature and some people are musicians and so forth first of all we have to admit what is god given talents are and not be frustrated because what we did what we lack in one thing we overcome in another thing but having said that i come from ethiopia and english is maybe my third or fourth language and if you ask me to write an essay on world history or what have you i will not be able to write a good essay because that requires language skills from a native speaker see my english is harrison textbook english medical journal textbook english my medical english is derived from readings on medical subjects from journals books and so forth so my mind has already memorized those styles and the only way you memorize those styles is by reading a lot of articles and so forth and when you write don't be afraid to apply because sometimes you read and say wow this is a nice introduction take it use it and it doesn't have to be written in blood or in american journal of hematology it can be written maybe in an economics journal or on cnn it doesn't really matter you look at how the thing is presented and if it appeals to you say why don't why can't i do that with my first paragraph or second paragraph in other words it is a mind cut and paste it's not a literal cut and paste but it is a mind cut and paste so you read you look at how some people express things and then you take it and you put it into your manuscript that what have nobody is born that way you have to get what's best from everyone to put it into and then make it yours as you get along and in the beginning it's hard but if you just keep writing it's just like statistics in the beginning it's hard but if you keep doing it and doing it then you become very good at it so just remember you don't have to be an english speaker you don't have to be this is all medical literature and medical literature is very separate from uh, uh, other english literature it's a matter of reading and applying and just reading it and then once you write it don't rush you sit down have your coffee relax and read it line by line and paragraph by paragraph look at it does it make sense grammatically as the punctuations right there and don't be afraid have somebody who is a native speaker or who is an english major read it and and then you learn and you learn and you get it just remember the first 5 years is going to be hard but after that whatever it's like um, swimming or biking once you learn it it comes naturally so just remember it is all about time reading and not being afraid of to put whatever you have written in your own style i've um, seen different mentors handle this scenario differently which is 
if you get a manuscript or a draft of a manuscript from a mentee that is not well written, how do you uh, handle that? How do you approach that scenario? Yes. So the first one, two papers, I write it them for them. I will write it for them because they need to be a first author in a good, wonderfully written paper. They need their name. They deserve it. They worked hard to get the data. They've done all everything. All I need to do is just a weekend to write it up for them. The first two things. And then by doing so, I will ask them, look at how I wrote, how I did that. <laughs> okay. Look at it, compare it to what you did. Okay. And then look at other papers. Now do better next time. That's all I say. Do better next time. I'm not going to say, oh, this is rubbish. What is this? Are you writing a letter to your brothers there or whatever? No, no. You just say, you do it for them. You deserve it. I'm doing this for you, but I want you to read it, understand how I did, look at how their papers are written, and do a better job next time. So they come back next time. If it is better, then you just continue to do that. You edit it for them, and then even better the next time. But if it is as bad, then there is an issue. There is an issue because there are certain things. At that point, I say it may not be a bad idea if you can work with some writer. There is, we have support. We have a library. There are people that can help you write. Why don't you do that? Because you want to be a good writer. This is the beginning. You might as well know how to write well in the beginning because I don't have time to go through grammars and so forth. So when there is a time that I might need to, to spend more time for them to become better writers, then I tell them, don't be afraid. This is not you. This is the first time you go in the library and it's probably a good idea to know two, three other people that give this kind of help. And people even pay for this. And don't be afraid. You got to do it. It's just like tennis. If you don't know how to learn it the right way in the first time, you will never be a good tennis player. Absolutely. Practice makes perfect. You've always emphasized how important it is for clinical investigators to first become master clinicians. For trainees and junior faculty on track to become independent clinician investigators, how do you think they should ideally balance their clinical and research time? Obviously, people are keen to establish themselves as researchers earlier in their careers. What advice do you give to fellows who are looking uh, for their first jobs and, and starting as in, at junior attendings? That, that is a very important question, believe it or not, because there is a sad situation uh, right now where every trainee that comes in is running around to get 90% protected or 80% protected time. Nobody wants to spend time seeing patients. It is amazing to me, especially, I don't know how it is in other major institutions. I, I, I suspect it is worse. Is that every trainee, and unfortunately, we're empowering that kind of behavior. And so everybody comes in, automatically they're 80% or 90% protected for the next five years. So what they have is maybe 10%, 20% time to see patients. I strongly believe that is a very unfortunate uh, deficit that we give to our future doctors. You trained to be a doctor, to see patients, to heal. You didn't train to be a researcher or a laboratory scientist. There is nothing wrong with that. But as a doctor, to be paid as a doctor, in order to be respected as a doctor, you have to become a doctor first. And a doctor first doesn't mean, oh, I've done fellowship, oh, so I'm a good doctor. You need another 25 years to become a good doctor. So I really feel that there is a mis... It's, an, it's almost an opportunity that's going to be lost, that, that you're in your prime time where you should spend the first five years, really seeing patients. I'm not saying that 100% patients, but really, you have to really see patients because that's the only way you learn to be a master physician. It doesn't come from reading Harrison's. It doesn't come from reading up to date. No, it's all about communication with the patient. You need to learn how to communicate. You need to feel it 
you need to feel it. And that requires five, 10 years of experience. So my advice is there's nothing wrong in writing grants and what have you. But if you want to be a good doctor, what's the rush? Why don't you spend the first two to five years really in the clinic? Try to understand the diseases that you're wanting to research on when you have time or when you take the grant instead of meandering around about this and that and this and that. I really feel that the first, personally, first five years should be primarily allocated to patient care if you want to be a master clinician. Yeah, but even then you won't be. It takes another 20, 25 years. It is those who choose that route that become master. You will never be a master clinician just after five years of seeing patients. But at least you will be a doctor. You will be a doctor. So. I feel, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit biased in this sense that, but you asked a master clinician, you can't have the cake and eat it too. And you can't, so it, it is very important to distinguish between the two. The next thing I wanted to ask about collaboration. So in your career, you have fostered amazing collaborations with other institutions, which has led to some of the landmark publications in MPN. Uh, I remember you saying at Dash Talk that choose your collaborators wisely. So can you expand on, upon that as to what you meant by that? And what advice would you give to junior faculty who are looking for external collaborators early in their career? Exactly. It's exactly the same pathway that we followed for choosing mentees and mentors. It's the same pathway. There needs to be a give and take. So when there is a need to give and take, you have to research it. What is it? Why do you want to collaborate with somebody? Is it just because of their name, which will be silly, you know? Or is it something that you need from them? For example, I have a fantastic collaboration with Dr. Alessandro Vanucci from the University of Florence in Italy. We have been collaborating for the last three decades, okay? Now, how do we do it? I have a thousand patients with ET. He has a thousand patients with ET. I have a thousand patients with PB. He has a thousand patients. I have a thousand with MF. He has a thousand with MF. In other words, we have equally rich database and patient care. And Therefore, there is a fantastic opportunity to give and take here. I can discover a model. He will validate it. He will discover a model. We will validate it. He wants to study something about certain diseases. He knows where to go. I've got the samples, the DNA, and everything, and vice versa. In other words, you have to choose what it is that you want to collaborate with and what is that person. So he is the ideal collaborator for me. Now, you could say there are other MPN specialists. I'm not looking for an MPN specialist. I'm looking for a collaborator. So remember, when you collaborate, you have to say, okay, why am I collaborating? How is this to enrich me rather than just doing it by myself? So it is very important when I say that, you mean you have to think, you have to ask the question, what is it that you want by the collaboration? And can you get it from there? I think, sorry, I was still thinking, ruminating on your advice about collaboration. I meant to be asking you the next question already. We wanted to ask next about clinical trials and becoming a clinical trialist, especially in an era where we, we're fortunate to see skyrocketing numbers of new drugs in hematologic malignancies. What's your advice to junior faculty who are enthusiastic to become clinical trialists? How do you advise them to approach uh, getting into the world of clinical trials? I want them, first of all, to understand what the objective of clinical trials is. And I think as young people, they probably have a misconception of that everything is done in the name of science and for the patient good. And that is so far from the truth. Clinical trials are primarily designed and run by pharmaceutical companies to get the drugs approved, period. That is a major drive for clinical trials from the pharmaceutical companies. Now, cooperative groups and investigator-initiated are different. 
cooperative group, for example, if you take ECOG, they do fantastic clinical trials. They ask the questions. Who is sitting on the driver's seat? The driver's seat, the doctors are sitting on the driver's seat. Those. They talk among themselves to see what's the good design, what's the question we want to ask, and so forth. They're not trying to get the drug approved or to make one drug better, look better than the others. Now, when it comes to industry sponsored clinical trials, number one, it is always targeted to either get their drug approved or expand the marketing for that particular drug. I don't care what anybody says, but that's because they are not reporting to your patients. They are reporting to the shareholders. So you have to remember when you want to become a clinical trialist, that means you might have to sell your soul at times. Because if you don't do, because they are on the driver's seat, meaning that if you don't do what they ask you to do, then they won't look for you. And that relationship can be very easily masked by a pseudo-scientific relationship between the, uh, the drug companies and the, the clinical trialists. Now, I don't want to, I'm not a therapeutic nihilist. There's always something good, but I want you to be aware. I want the fellows to be aware that when you do a clinical trial, remember who is guiding the clinical trial. Who came up with the design? What's the purpose? What's the ultimate purpose? Does this make sense? Is this another Me Too clinical trial and so forth? And it is up to you. It is up to you. For example, as a principal, I have stayed away from Me Too clinical trials. I'm not interested in doing adding a little bit of that and a little bit of this and doing a big phase three and see which is a little bit better. And I like to advance the science. I mean, and uh, much in, in, in line with what MD Anderson is doing mostly. They're mostly involved in phase one, phase two clinical trials. They're really moving the envelope. And that's the kind of study that I am interested in. So your fellows should also ask themselves, what exactly are they looking for in a clinical trial? And then the choosing will become, if any of the fellows want to be clinical trialists, the most important point is to choose the institution that you work at. Because no matter how much you like it, some institutions have a very well-oiled machine of doing clinical trials. It's very easy to get going. If you go to MD Anderson and what have you, you can just get going. You go in and immediately you're given a PI position or what have you, and boom. Alternatively, you go to other places, you might have to come up with a design, and write the, write the protocol, and you probably need help from a company, and then you probably end up doing an industry-sponsored clinical trial, which is really to uh, help the industry approve their drug. So you will have to choose. So if you ask me a, a solid scientific person of integrity want to do clinical trials, then choose a good institution to work with and go with those institutions or join a cooperative group like ECAG and where you will have, you'll be trained, you'll be doing so forth. I want to come back to both of those examples. If we come back to industry for a second, you talked about to some extent having to sell your soul. How do you decide if there's a, if there's a compound that you're interested in or a group that you want to work with, but say the control arm is not the choice you would have used or the dosing you don't feel is right, or there's some other issue with the design of the clinical trial. How do you balance when you push back and when you say something to the sponsor versus when you acquiesce and, and just go with the design that you've been given? I don't. I, I, I don't compromise. See, I, but that's me. There's a lot, a lot of people that compromise. See, I, as a principal, have made it important for me not to be involved in any kind of a speaker's bureau or advisory board. You don't see my name anywhere. I have no conflict, okay? That's a personal decision. That personal decision comes from the fact that I don't mind dying with $1 million rather than $1 billion. I don't need $1 billion. It's all about greed. As physicians, we're paid very well. We're content. So if you are happy, that's the begin, the start point. If you are happy with where you are, those things that you're talking about, 
that are very easy. They're very easy to decide upon. So if a drug company says, I've got this drug and you're interested in that drug, but they want you to do it this way, you say, bye, I'm not interested, period. They will find somebody else who is interested and who will do what they want them to do. It's not, yeah, they will live fine, but at least you sleep well and you just move on. The world, listen, 100 years from now, everybody's gonna be dead, okay? Who cares? It is very important to remember that you don't have to do everything. That's what I teach my students. I always teach them that there is life beyond getting a clinical trial open. There is life beyond publishing in any jam. There is life beyond getting a grant at NIH, okay? And that life is much more precious to live. So you've already won. You're healthy, you're a doctor, you're making much more money than 90% of the population. Be happy. At that point, then your spiritual happiness becomes important. Then you have to do things that you think are right. So those are the choices we made. I hope I answered your question in a, an indirect way, but in a manner to tell you that it's about making compromises. You, you stay there. And I don't make compromises. If I'm going to do a clinical trial, I've got to sit or co-sit at the driver's seat. Yeah, I think that's very valuable advice. I think the challenge often for junior faculty who might have less, less of a name or less ability to, uh, less power in that negotiating relationship is it can be very tricky to say no to what is what might be perceived as a good opportunity. But well, I, I definitely... The, that, that's why you need a mentor, right? As a junior faculty, you're not there in, a, in the middle of nowhere you do have the mentors that you trust. So perhaps you let them take, let them make the decision. At least you're not putting yourself into it. Let them make the decision and then you do what you need to do. At least you're not directly involved in the conspiracy. The conspiracy. I also wanted to ask you the second part about cooperative group trials. Obviously, that these can be plagued by a different set of challenges in needing to appease lots of different stakeholders, complex approval processes, lots of bureaucracy. You can have a really good idea. And by the time it's, it's a bit like sometimes with a manuscript, where you have enough reviewers, the idea that you start with becomes something very different once it's been through the kind of machinery of a cooperative group. So how do you advise mentors in terms of when to persevere through that long process and how to balance the kind of different stakeholders in cooperative group trials? It depends on who you are and what you want. See, for me, it makes absolutely no sense to be a specialist in one field, do all of the work. And if I do a cooperative group trial, the cooperative group chair will be the last author. It makes no sense to me. See, there, there have rules and it makes no sense to me that is gonna take five years to open the clinical trial and close it and then publish it. See, life is too short. For me, I don't work in that kind of framework, but that's me. But there are others who are happy to just be around and they sit around and talk for the next five years about a protocol. And that's fine. I think to each its own. But for me, I need to move on. I don't have time. I, I, I need to just move on. And it really depends on who you are and what you want to do. I can assure you that there are, I have a lot of colleagues who are not unhappy about uh, a particular treatment protocol getting written, prepared, reviewed, executed, and the publication comes 10 years. This is a real story that I'm telling you, okay? 10 years from the time it's conceived. See, I don't have that temperament. I got to do a lot of things, a lot of fast things. So I let that to those who want to do it that way. It's a division of labor. I'm not undermining their value, but I don't want them to undermine my value too. So I think there is a niche for everybody. And as a trainee, you have to choose. You have to choose. Do you want to just be engaged in that kind of uh, thing? Or do you want to go on the fast lane? If you want to go to a fast lane, Find an institution where it is the work ethics to do that, where there is a culture of doing that. If you want to go fast, go to MD Anderson. 
or Memorial Sloan Catering or somewhere where they have the engine going already and just jump on the bandwagon. But otherwise, sometimes you have no, but you have, it's all about you. And at the end of the day, you don't have to do it. Just remember, you're okay. You don't have to do it. I think one one question I wanted to ask is an advice probably to a junior investigator who Raj, Eddie and me are like, what is the perfect balance between investigative initiator trials versus industry sponsor versus cooperative? Because as a junior investigator, we all have limited time given the clinical, which is very important. But in terms of prioritizing, should we prioritize investigative initiator trials? as a top priority versus industry versus cooperative? Nowadays, the industry sponsored trials are already written by the industry and they just fall in your desk. You sign on, you sign off. You're usually not involved in the design of the study and what have you. And so that, that's already been taken care of. The matter of it is, is, are you ready to help the industry? The, the farmer, that drug to be approved, pretty much. And, and then, of course, they will get you uh, invited. They will pay your trip. And they make you feel important. Even though they very much know that they do whatever they want, you think that you're contributing, and that's fine. That's industry-sponsored clinical trials right now. It's, they're all, it's all done by industry. So it's really, where, it, it depends on where you are, because they don't come to some other place where you might be. They usually come to the high institutions. And if you're there, you chime in there and one of your colleagues may allow you to be first author on this one and this one. That's how it happens. To me, that's all noise. It's not you, okay? I saw your first name on uh, that. No. It's every, the paper is written by the industry. So you're not gonna get any respect from me, all right? So basically, it is what it is. That's how it is. Now. Investigator initiated is tougher because you have to deal with institutional bureaucracy, number one, and then FDA. And it's just, there are a lot of bureaucracy. It's almost, do you feel like the pharma lobbyists are trying to make it harder for you so that they can do everything themselves? It, it is very difficult. But if you're managed to do that, then you will be in the driver's seat. So it will be better. Now, remember the institutions, some institutions are very well, the infrastructure is there to do these things properly. Your research should be to understand what each institution is all about. You have to identify what institutions you want to go as a clinical researcher and then talk to the people over there and understand how, and then you'll find out really, because every institution works differently. It really depends on what you want to do. If you want to be, if you want to do that kind of research, you might be best doing investigator initiator, no matter how much time. But it has to be a critical question that would really not just be a publication, but also would change practice or influence practice. So I think we had really good discussions. I wanted to wrap up with a couple of questions. One, one thing that we were curious about that what is the best career advice that you have ever received? There is no one career advice. There is actually several that really come to mind. I've had very, in the old days, we had real professors. It's not real professors. It's not just uh, what they know as a, a doctor, as a physician, but also what they know as in life and, and so forth. They're truly master, true professors. And, and I remember that there are certain things they tell you that kind of sticks with you. And, and these things don't come only from professors. <laughs> they come from everywhere. Some of them come even from rap lyrics, believe it or not. And I remember a rap lyric, for example. I know a lot of people are embarrassed to say this, but no, I listen to lyrics. And if you have time, watch TV. Don't watch me. I think there's so much in that saying, meaning that don't waste your time thinking about what others can think of you or how others are going to judge your work. That's the most important advice. And, and, and this, <laughs> it was a rap lyric. And basically, if just concentrate and focus on yourself and on your work, don't just run around 
uh, uh, Twitter and just see who said that and about this and, and about that and so forth. Focus on yourself and on your work. You are your own world. That's your stage. And just write and study, study, and don't write it to get kudos. Write it with the true intention of advancing the science, helping patients, and so forth. Don't write it so that you can get it published in any JM or Blood or American Journal of Hematology. Write it, okay, this is a good piece. I think this should be communicated. It doesn't matter where you publish it. The good scientists, the good doctors around will see it. We'll find it. It's an internet. So I think it's important that you focus on your work because there'll be less frustration, less misery, and you'll be much more productive. So look at yourself, not outside of yourself. And don't do things to get kudos. Just do them because they need to be done. I was wondering if we might, Raj's question made me think of another question I wanted to ask you, which is you, we've talked a lot about mentorship and you mentioned that your advice is to have different mentors for different elements of life and of career. I wonder if you could reflect on some of your mentors and the different areas of your life and career that they've helped you with. Yes, yes. Most of the help that I have gotten from mentors is opening doors because I worked very hard to where I get. But I needed someone to open the doors for me. My first door was opened by a hematologist called Dr. Christian Winter, who was in Chicago when I was doing my internal medicine residency at St. Joseph Hospital. And she was uh, the attendee, but she was a male alumnus. She trained at Mayo. And she liked the work I was doing. So she picked up the phone, called the Mayo Clinic, because that's where she used to be, and talked to the chair and said, you have to take the ferry. He's wonderful. Next day, I got a call from Mayo Clinic. They wanted me to come for an interview. And that was it, period. To me, that opening door, that particular door, made all the difference. The second door was opened to me by Dr. Murray Silverstein, who's, who died at the young age of 68 in, in, in September 1998. He was the guru of myeloproliferative neoplasms, an international expert. And he, he told me and said, Tap, why don't you do this and you'll be the first author and I'll be your second author. And he let me just run with it. And it, we published, everybody knew him, nobody knew me, but because it spoke nicely of me and so forth. And that's how I became interested and in others being interested in me and myeloproliferative neoplasms. That's the second. Now, others have also helped me by being there and being role models. Robert Kyle. Robert Kyle is going to be 96 this year. And I still see him walk. Sometimes when I go for a walk in between patients, I find him and we talk. 96, okay? But he is a master myeloma. There is no one better than Robert Kyle when it comes to myeloma. The whole world knows it. But more than that, he is a wonderful man. By the way, he just published a book. I would strongly recommend you guys go buy it and, and read it. He doesn't need the money, but it's just a very good story. And Bob Kyle, he wasn't even my direct mentor, he's myeloma. But by being there, by just watching him, how he carries it himself, how wonderful a mentor he was for Maury Gertz, how wonderful a mentor he was for Vince Rajkumar. These are fantastic people who came all from that mentorship. But I was there, I was around with these people. So I can I am telling you all the different people in my life that may not be direct, but they were there and their presence made all the difference. So I think you've already given so many advice that it's probably already been covered, but I still wanted to ask you that if you had one 
piece of advice to give to an early stage clinician investigator, what would that be? Anything that stands out to you or anything else that you wanted to mention? There is life. I think I've already told you that. There is life beyond an EJM publication. There is life beyond getting a grant and IH. There is life beyond having a podium presentation at ASH. That's the piece of advice. Everything has a half-life of two days, three days. You could be great at an ASH presentation. You get an oral presentation. Nobody will remember it after a week. Okay. Remember that this world is the come and go, it comes and goes and comes and goes. Have a thick skin. Just remember happiness is within you. Don't try to get happiness from outside. Very important. As a, a junior person going into it, remember you've already won. Whatever you get on top of that is a bonus. Remember that and remember where you come from. Always remember everybody around you. Okay? Don't put on a, a, a temper tantrum just because your paper did not get accepted or this or that. That should be the list of your problems. Remember the patient you saw the previous day. Remember their facial expression, how happy they were in seeing you, how they, they look up to you like you are the only person on earth. Why do you completely ignore that and want to get that accolade from someone else that you don't know about? Why can't it be enough for you to just be happy with your patients being happy and smiling on your face and so forth. Remember that. If you can remember that, then you'll be happy. Thank you very much, Dr. Tafiri. I think that's a really good note to end on. This was really awesome. And we look forward to having you again on our podcast to discuss about MPNs and clinics. Oh, absolutely. And it's my pleasure. And thank you very much. And uh, I will uh, look forward to seeing you again. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Tafiri. Thank you. Dr. Thank you.